With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. I have to admit to you I boasted prematurely last week about me picking up the pace through the book of Hebrews. Some months ago I had shared with the staff that I thought I would treat this 11th chapter commonly called Faith's Hall of Fame, that I would treat it in big chunks and bold, broad sections. I did not intend to bog down and study verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. So I preached one sermon from verse 1, another from verse 2, another from verse 3, another from verse 4. And last week, I arrogantly told you that I was going to preach two verses, verses 5 and 6. But in the first service, I barely got to verse 6 and did not get to it at all in this service. And so I want to just eat a little crow this morning as a long-winded preacher and back up and share with you what the text means when we look in the sixth verse. Now, I don't want to be too long-winded. One of my favorite stories to tell is of the long-winded preacher who got up one Sunday and preached for five minutes before he called for the invitation. The next Sunday, ten minutes, and he called for the invitation. The third week, he preached for an hour and 45 minutes. And a little old granny asked him at the handshaking line about the difference in the length of his last three sermons. She said, I'm not complaining, but two weeks ago, five minutes, last week, 10 minutes, today, an hour, 45. He said, that's easy to explain. Several weeks ago, I had major dental surgery. They fitted me for dentures. I got up that first Sunday. Five minutes was all I could do. My mouth was so sore. My jaw was so tight. Last Sunday, I felt a little better. I could go 10 minutes. Today, I apparently put in my wife's dentures and I couldn't stop talking. You'll be happy to know I brought my own teeth with me this morning, but the writer of Hebrews tells us some things we must believe. You do understand there are some things you must believe in order to be saved. You have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are other things you must believe to be doctrinally sound. There are people who are genuinely saved, but they're mixed up on various areas of Bible doctrine. But here in Hebrews 11.6, we read about three things you must believe in order to be pleasing to God. Did you notice this trilogy as I read the text? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For the one who would come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder. But listen, friend, He's not a rewarder of everybody. He is not even going to be a rewarder of every believer. But he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Three things you must believe to live a life pleasing to God. Now, number one, just jot this down. You must believe in the reality of God. Now, this may sound overly basic, bottom shelf, and simplistic. But if you're going to please God, first of all, you have to believe in God. Famed atheist Richard Dawkins once said that religion is a fairy tale for people who are afraid of the dark. I say that atheism is a fairy tale for people who are afraid of the light. By the way, do you know what you get when you cross an atheist and a Jehovah's false witness? Somebody who knocks on your door for no apparent reason at all. You have to believe that God is. Now, We very rarely stop and just give a full-throated attack against the flawed belief of atheism, but it's what the writer tells us here. If you're going to come to God and be pleasing to Him, you must first believe that He is. I got a simple illustration of this truth just yesterday working out in our yard. I had to send one of my children up to the house, and my dad had come over to help me with something. Go ask Papa, would he bring out a bottled water? Daddy's very thirsty. And so the report came back. Is this what my father sent? Yes, it's what the father sent. I looked at the label. The label seemed to be right. It said bottled water. It looked like bottled water. And when I took the top off of it and began to drink it, it refreshed me just like water has always done. So I had a witness from my father. I had a witness with my own two eyes. And I had an internal witness that it was what it claimed to be. And I want to call these three witnesses to the pulpit today to testify about the reality of God. First, let's listen to what our Father says. I've called Him an eternal witness. More specifically, I want the triune God to come and testify. What does the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit say about the very existence, the reality of God? Well, God the Father 
never seeks to prove his own existence. He is the self-existent, self-evident creator God. And he never makes an argument for his existence. He just simply declares himself to be. The word God appears more than 4,000 times in the biblical record. And some would say that's circular reasoning. But I remember the illustration given by Dr. Adrian Rogers. He said, if I had a pocket knife and I said it would cut you and you said, no, it won't cut me. He said, I could prove it to you one of two ways. I could prove the knife will cut you by giving you a history lesson in knife making and a chemical study of of surgical steel, or I could just open up the blade and cut you with it, and in either case, I would prove my point. Well, God the Father just opens up his own inspired word and cuts you to the quick with the reality that God exists. God the Son makes a claim about the reality of God. You remember in Luke chapter 2 when he was left at the temple in Jerusalem? He told his parents, where did you think I would be? I must be about my father's business. Seated in the temple one day in Luke chapter 4, he read from the scroll of Isaiah and said, the spirit of the sovereign God is upon me. The night before his death in John 14, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus did not say that if you're pure in heart, you'll see an apparition, or you'll see an idea, or you'll see a theory, or some abstract notion. Jesus said if you are pure in heart, you'll be blessed because one day you will see God. In his temptations in the wilderness, the master replied that you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. He said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Now, when you go to court, sometimes you look for an expert witness, somebody who's credentialed to tell the truth. Well, Jesus is an expert witness, well, on everything. And he raises his hand and he tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the reality of God. God the Father, God the Father. The Son. What about God, the Holy Spirit? Jesus said that when the Spirit of truth came, He would testify of Christ and would guide the people of God into all truth. We ought to write down a reference to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Speaking of the biblical doctrine of justification by grace through faith, the Apostle Paul said that the Spirit of God testifies to us, to our spirit, that we are the children of God. Not the children of a theory, but the children of a very real God. Legendary humorist and comedian Will Rogers was once trying to get a passport. To get that, he needed his birth certificate, but he couldn't find it. And the clerk at the office said, I have to have your birth certificate. I must have proof of your birth. And Will Rogers said, I am proof of my birth. And in a very similar way for believers, God's testimony about himself is proof enough. And if you're going to live a life that's pleasing to God, you have to believe that he is. Now, I'm highly doubtful there are very many confirmed atheists in this service today. There may be some. But may I ask, if we were to follow you around and listen to what you say, I'm talking about the words that you use. If we were to observe your conduct, if we watched what you watched, went where you went, listened to what you listened to, if we could read your mind and know what, we, what you thought, would we have any idea that you believe there's a God in heaven with whom we must contend? God, the eternal witness, testifies about his own reality. But not only is there an eternal witness, that is what, what the Father says about himself, there's an external witness. What you can see with your eyes, like the label on that bottle of water. If you ever doubt the reality of God, just hold your own hand up in front of your face. You are a brilliant creation of a creator. And when you get tired of looking at your own body, put some clothes on and walk out your front door and look at the trees raising their hands to their creator. Listen to the dogs barking and the cats meowing and listen to the birds chirping in the trees. Watch the flowers testify 
to the glory of a very real God. And you'll say together with the hymn writer, this is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light and the lily white declare their maker's praise. And in the very same way that when you see a painting, you know there was a painter. When you see a building, there must have been a builder. When you see a watch, you know there was a watchmaker. When you see the creation, there must be a creator. And if you do not believe in him, you'll never live a life that is pleasing to him. No reference is any more straightforward or succinct than the opening verse of your Bible where Moses writes under divine inspiration that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That one verse preaches a powerful sermon about who God is and what God has done. That one verse refutes atheism for it says that God created the universe. It refutes polytheism for it teaches that there is one God existing in three persons. It refutes pantheism which teaches that God is everything and everything is God. For it teaches us that neither nature nor the universe is God but they are the created byproducts of the one true living God. That one verse refutes humanism teaching that God is the center of reality and it refutes evolution, teaching that creation has been created by God. In his brilliant commentary on the book of Genesis, Henry Morris writes that it has often been pointed out that if a person really believes Genesis 1-1, he will not find it difficult to believe anything else recorded in the Bible. And I have found that through my own experience and study to be the truth. If the self-existent God can merely speak in the breath of his mouth and the word of his power can create everything out of nothing, then is anything too hard for this God? Jeremiah connects the doctrine of creation and God's ability to sustain and care for his people when he writes, Ah, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your own great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. I'm talking about the external witness of creation. Paul picks up this truth and writes in Romans 1.20 that since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his divine power and divine, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How? Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. There, Paul writes of the reprobate mind of depraved humanity and teaches us that while, he, that while creation is not sufficient to convert a man, creation teaches sufficient evidence to condemn a man. No one has ever been saved merely by watching the plants grow and the flowers wave and the birds chirp. But that is not enough to convert a man, but it is enough to condemn a man even in the deepest part of the darkest jungle because creation testifies that there is a God, you're not him, and you are going to be accountable to him. I also believe this is one reason that creation is a favorite target of the devil himself. Because if he can teach you that there was no creator, then there was no creation, then there was no creator, there was no Adam If there's no Adam, there was no sin. If there is no sin, there is no judgment. If there is no judgment, there are no rules. And I can do whatever I please and live how I wish. There are witnesses that testify to the reality of God. And the one who would come to God to live a life pleasing to him must first believe that he is. There's the eternal witness. The external witness. There is thirdly what I would call the experiential witness. Not only what has been said to me, not only what I can see with my eyes, but what I have felt in my heart. Now let me be very, very clear. Our beliefs are not based on our experiences. Our beliefs are not founded on our feelings. But our beliefs are validated and by God's precious mercy, our beliefs are often confirmed by our experiences and our feelings. For example, God testifies about his reality to me when he brings comfort in my sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 1.3, Paul said that God is the God of all comfort. But if you've lived and experienced the heartaches of this life, 
You don't need to read that at the hand of the Apostle Paul. You've experienced it firsthand. So might I ask you this morning, if God is not real, when the weight of this world was crushing in and pressing down on you, who was it that sustained you? I'll tell you who it was. It was a very unseen hand of a very real God. If God is not real, then who was it at the doctor's office? When the diagnosis was bad and the outlook even worse. When hope seemed limited and your options seemed even more limited. If God is not real, then who was it reaching down to sustain you? At the funeral home when you were picking out a casket for your spouse or your parents. Who was it that was sustaining you at the attorney's office when you had to deal with those divorce papers? Hey, if God is not real, who was it that held your hand and comforted your soul at the banker's office when they were foreclosing on your house? Could I get more personal? If God is not real, who was it that strengthened you at the boss's office when you walked out with a pink slip in your hand or you left the principal's office with a suspension notice about your child in your hand? Who was it that held you up and kept you pressing on when the news was so bad you didn't think you were going to make it? I'll tell you who it was. It was the same God who by the breath of his mouth created all things by the very word of his power. The old preacher said, don't try to tell me God is dead. I just talked to him this morning. And one of the times I talked to him was when he was was bringing comfort in the midst of my sorrow. I've experienced his reality also when he brought conviction in my sin. For if God is not real, who was that bothering me at the midnight hour? Calling me and causing me to wrestle with my own sin and shortcomings of his glory. Who was it that would not let me rest until I had offered that apology? Who was it that would not let me rest until I had dealt with the root of bitterness? Who was it that would not let me rest until I had reconciled and made the matter right? Who was it that would not let me rest, but oh, by His grace did let me rest when I said, Father, I have sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. Child of God, that didn't come from Hollywood, that didn't come from Washington, and that didn't come from your own personal conscience. The conviction of sin is the evidence of God. I have felt him in the midnight hour as comfort in my sorrow, conviction in my sin, and I can, ex- can attest to his reality by the conversion of my soul. Hey, lean in close, child of God. If God's not real... Who was it that stopped by the vacation Bible school that Tuesday night? Found you lost and dead in your trespasses and sins. Quickened you unto life everlasting. Gave you the gift of faith. And and in mercy he called on you. And in faith you called on him back. Who was that? That turned the drunkard into a daddy. And the harlot into a homemaker. Who turned the thief into an honest person? I'll tell you who it was. It was a God who loved you enough to send his son into this world. That you could receive the gift of eternal life. The Bible says that if you're going to live a life that's pleasing to God, first of all, you've got to believe that He is. Could I ask you this morning, do you believe, not intellectually, but in your heart, do you really believe that there is a God, that He's over you, you're under Him, and you'll give an account to Him? You've got to believe in the reality of God. There's a second thing we see in this verse that you must believe. I'm talking about to live a life that's pleasing to God. Secondly, you must believe in the reward from God. Bottom line, the Bible teaches that we can and should seek to live a life that will be rewarded by God. One old gospel song says, just give me a little cabin in the corner of glory land. Hogwash! I want to hear my master say, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Not a little rundown shack on the backside of glory land. The Bible says that if without faith it is impossible to please him. For the one who would come to God, did you see it in verse 6? 
Look at it in your text. Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. A rewarder. Now believe it or not, in that little phrase, he is a rewarder. Would you be surprised that I have found three truths in that one little phrase? First of all, I want you to consider with me the promise by the Lord. That he is a rewarder. That phrase, he is, is a very interesting word in the Greek of the New Testament. It's the word genomai. I'll not bog down or bore you with the grammar and the details here, but it's a form of the verb to be. But it typically is used to relate to something that is going to come to pass. In fact, this is a favorite word of the Apostle Matthew. He uses it regularly in his gospel, and it is often translated as, and it came to pass. It often speaks of the passing of chronological time. This is the word that Matthew and other Bible writers use when they say, and when evening had come. When the evening genomide. When the morning had come. That which you'd been looking for, longing for, even waiting for. When it had finally genomied. When it had begun to be. It would be used to describe the arrival of a feast or a festival on the, cal- on the calendar. And when the days of this or that had come. It's a word that speaks of a present reality, but yet it is something that we may or may not have yet seen with the eyes of the flesh. But we see it with the eyes of faith, which is the grand theme of this 11th chapter. And to a congregation that received this first century letter, many of whom were suffering persecution and pressure, some of them were experiencing the pain of trying to walk with and serve God. Some, we already learned, were beginning to turn away, fall away, and turn back into their previous dead life of religion. The writer here says, if you're going to press on and live a life that's pleasing to God, You've got to not only believe that God is, but you've got to believe by faith that one day God is going to reward you. Paul taught this same theme in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now I dare say most of the time when that verse is quoted, it's usually quoted in the negative. Of someone has committed a sin, they're living in rebellion, maybe they think they're getting away with it, and some well-intentioned believer will say, they're not going to get away with it, God's not going to be mocked, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to rape. And it's usually said about like that. Like you're actually glad that a whirlwind of corruption is going to come crashing down on their head. You're going to rape what you sow. But in its immediate context, Its primary application is to the weary child of God. Who the devil has begun to whisper to you. Those hours of service haven't amounted to anything. Those months of living for Christ have come to naught. Those hours and months... Indeed, years of trying to serve Jesus. They've done you and they've done no one else any good. And the Apostle Paul says, if you believe that, you've been deceived by the devil. God is not going to be mocked. What you have sown into the kingdom of Christ, you shall reap. Two verses later in Galatians 6, 9, he expounds further. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season. Would you say due season? My problem is I live in this season. But God has promised there's coming a due season. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
Many preachers have commented on the law of the harvest that you will reap what you sow, where you sow, more than you sow. Child of God, you will reap later than you sow. God does not always give an immediate harvest when we sow the seeds of fidelity. But lean in close and listen. God is not going to let you step into eternity with Him being your debtor. We are indebted to God. Christ will never be indebted to us. If he promised us a reward, he's going to give that reward. If he has promised us a trophy, he'll give that trophy. If he has promised us a crown, he will give that crown. If he has promised us blessing, he will give those blessings. You will reap what you sow in due season. If you stay faithful and don't faint, the promise by the Lord. Note with me also the purpose of this list. I'm just trying to establish the context of Hebrews 11.6. It's obviously in the broader context of Hebrews 11, faith's hall of fame. And these stories are not listed here for you to gawk at and be amazed at the faith of Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are listed here according to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. As a great cloud of witnesses who would testify to you by their very life's testimony that you should persevere in faithfulness to God. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't turn around. Don't throw it in. Don't give it up. The writer would say it wasn't easy for for, for Enoch. But Enoch walked with God and God blessed and rewarded him. It wasn't easy for Noah We'll examine him in our next lesson, but but God blessed him and rewarded him. It wasn't easy for Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but they were faithful to God, and God proved faithful to them. Do you think it was easy for Joseph, rejected by his own, falsely accused, wrongly imprisoned, tragically forgotten, but God in his own due season... Raised him up and rewarded him and blessed him. And some of those rewards will come in this life. But most of the people in this chapter, the Bible will tell us, they died in faith, having never seen with their eyes or touched with their hands the fulfillment of the promises of God. But I've been blessed in many dark nights the last year by a wonderful gospel song that says, there's never been a moment he won't see me through. There's never been a morning his mercies aren't new. There's never been a long night. He's not all I need. He's never made a promise that he does not keep. And the saints of Hebrews 11 would rise up with Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 and say, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor for the Lord, listen, child of God, it is not in vain there's the promise by the Lord there's the purpose of this list that leads to a third item the peace from that lesson for you see the truth is if you're going to have the testimony of being pleasing to God you're going to have to find something you can hang your spiritual hat on other than your circumstances Because while I've never been tired of serving the Lord, I've gotten tired from serving the Lord. And I've gotten tired in serving the Lord. And there's been a time or two I've gotten put up, fed up, and put out with some of the other servants of the Lord. As I'm confident, I have brought many frustration into the heart and life of my fellow servants. Remember the context here, first century believers turning around and giving up under persecution, the loss of property and possessions, wondering, is it worth it at all? And the writer says, now, if you're going to live a life that's pleasing to God, you got to reject that deceptive question from the devil. You must Believe that he is and that he is going to reward. 
You have to believe in the reality of God. You have to believe in the reward from God. And you have to believe in the requirement by God. For you see, not all of God's children are going to be rewarded. Everyone will be recompensed, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for the deeds done in the flesh, whether they be good or bad. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, did you know that some of God's children will get into heaven by what we would call the skin of our teeth? Saved, the text says, as though by fire. So not all will be rewarded. There is a requirement to get in on this reward, and it's right here in the text. You must believe... That he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Three things from that final phrase. Living a life that's pleasing to God first, it requires pursuit. You've never drifted toward Christ one day of your life. Listen to me now. You have never drifted toward godliness, not one moment in your life. The default setting of the human heart is a tendency to drift away from the Lord, not toward the Lord. So this is something we must pursue. The whole verse begins by saying that without faith it's impossible to please Him for the one who would come to Him. The one who says, I'm tired of sin and straying, Lord. Now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love. I'll believe thy word. Now I'm coming home. Oh, you're going to come to him? That's good. You've got to pursue him with all of your heart. And the good news is for the child of God, if you will seek him, he can and will be found. 1 Chronicles 16, 11. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, David told his son Solomon, Seek him, and he will be found. God's not trying to hide himself, his face, or his will from you. Psalm 9, verse 10, Lord, you have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 105, verse 3, Glory in his holy name, and let the heart of those rejoice who seek after the Lord. Now, if you know your Bible... You know that lost people cannot in and of themselves seek after God. But the problem, the tragedy is, far too many saved people don't seek after Him either. There must be a pursuit of God. Note with me also, it requires persistence. For this word translated here as seek is a powerful word in the Greek of the New Testament. It describes something that is a steadfast and continual practice. This is why the King James picks up on that nuance and inserts a word, a modifier, and says if you're going to live a life pleasing to God, you've got to believe He rewards those who diligently seek Him. It's not something you can do just once upon a time. Some years ago, I had the blessing to travel out to uh, the West, and I took my daughter Sarah to a conference. It wasn't too far from the Grand Canyon, so we tacked on a few conference days and went to see the Grand Canyon. And for everybody who says it's just a big pile, of big hole in the ground, well, a lot of truth to that. It's an impressive hole in the ground. It's a beautiful hole in the ground, but now I can say, Grand Canyon, I've been there, done that. Didn't get a t-shirt, they cost too much. But if you were to ask me, Pastor, would you like to spend hundreds and hundreds, uh, maybe over $1,000 to go see the Grand Canyon again? No. Once was enough. But you'll never live a life pleasing to God if you have a once was enough approach to seeking God. You'll never be an athlete if you only practice once. You'll never be a bodybuilder if you only lift weights once. 
You'll never be a scholar or an expert in any field of study if you only read about that subject once. And you'll never live a life pleasing to God if you only set out to seek to please Him once. Friend, you'll never be a prayer warrior if you pray once. You'll never be a Bible student if you... If you say, well, I tried one time to get up early in the morning to read my Bible and to pray. I tried that once and it didn't work because it's never been designed to work once. It only works if we diligently persist in seeking after God. Well, I shared the gospel once. Well, that's the problem. I gave in the offering once. Well, that's the problem. If you're going to live a life pleasing to God, you've got to to square your shoulders, plant your feet, and say along with the songwriter, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And if I die in faith, having never seen the blessings of God for my faithfulness to him. I will die in faith trusting that I'll receive that reward from him on the other side. God is not going to be mocked. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The requirement for that blessing requires pursuit and persistence. Finally, it requires priority. Priority. Look at the last phrase. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. I find it interesting that the thing you have to seek after to be rewarded is not the reward. It's not the blessing. It's not the hand. It's not the gift or the trophy or the crown, though all of those things will come. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Listen, friend, because the life that is pleasing to God sees Christ And seeks Christ as the reward itself. You remember Paul's testimony? After giving all of his credentials, he said, I counted all his loss for the sake of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. In Psalm 27, verse 4, David prayed. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord and behold His beauty. Father, the sum total and the priority of my life, I want to be with you. I want to see you in fellowship with you and know you. And this is the secret to living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. My senior year of high school, I had a job that I did not like. I worked in the men's department at the Valdosta Mall, uh, men's department at Sears at the Valdosta Mall. And I did not like that job because God did not wire me to work a cash register in retail. He wired some of you that way. May God richly bless you. And may you live to see your children's children. But I hated that job. I wanted to quit that job. Like some of you, no doubt, from time to time, want to give up on being a homeschool mom. You want to give up teaching Sunday school. You see no benefit, blessing, or reward from serving Christ. That's how I felt on that job. I I hated it. However, the year of my senior year in high school was also the year of my parents' 25th anniversary. My two sisters were older and they had kind of a real job already and so they were bearing the majority of the finances for preparing and planning my parents' 25th wedding anniversary reception. But I did not want to get to the reception and have had no part in blessing my parents who had done so much for me. And there were many times while I was wiping down the shelves and folding up the shirts and waiting on customers who tried my nerve. And I say nerve because they got on my last one. (laughs) But there were many times I I persevered and pressed on. 
because I wanted a reward. And the, re- the reward was not going to be in an envelope at the end of the week. The reward for me in that setting was going to be in the fellowship hall at the church. When I had a chance to take part in a celebration to tell my parents, this is what I think of you and what you've done for me. I think that is much what is on the mind of the writer of Hebrews. You want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord? You've got to be willing to persevere and endure knowing that you're going to be rewarded for that. And do you know what you're going to do with those rewards? You're going to lay them at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus. And say, I did this for you. And you deserve all the praise, all the glory, and all of the honor. And when we live a life like that, that is a life with which God is well pleased. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.